Uh, welcome to Science of the Times 2021. Just think of that time, 2021. For those who are older and much wiser than, than I certainly am, um, who would have thought that in 2021 the Lord Jesus would still remain away? Because for some of you, you have witnessed the, the re-establishment of the, the state of Israel, of God's people coming back to the land. You have been eyewitnesses, as it were, of those wonderful things that God has promised in his word. We know, don't we, that God's people are his, his witnesses, and we look to them um, for this. And when we think of the, the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the, the book of the Revelation, those things that he would write and prophesy, those things which were shortly to come to pass, and we see them, don't we, unfolding before us as we look back and most of those things are um, history. We can see the unfolding of those things, of the seals and of the trumpets and of the vials or, or those bowls. And it's incredible, isn't it, if you just turn to Revelation 16, that we are at that end time now that it speaks about as we look through um, prophecy and the history that's gone before. And, and thinking of the time in which we live now, it says, doesn't it, in Revelation um, 16 uh, and verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then we get those lovely words that we behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So blessed are they who stay awake, who are alert and who guard those garments. Similar words to how the, the revelation opens in Revelation one, blessed are those that hear and that keep the words, those that guard those words which are, are written down. And when we look at um, the things that are happening in the world around us, when we think of the signs of the times, we can look at them coming from a, 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 a big point of view, from the macro point of view, and also from a micro point of view. And whichever way we look at these things, we know that we are in the last days. When we think of things from a, a macro point of view, we think of um, God's creation, the seven days of creation. And, and we know don't we, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And, and we know that there has been through six thousand years, as it were, of man's rule. And we look forward to that time of rest when God rested on that seventh day, that time of restitution. And we, too, look forward to that time. Uh, and we look forward to that time of rest. Because it says in the Hebrews, there remaineth a rest. So let us labor to enter into that rest. And if we zoom in on a, on a micro level, and we are uh, tonight to look at some of these things, just a few things, we see uh, around us how these things of God's plan and purpose are coming to pass, are coming to fruition just as he has written down in his word. Let's just turn to that reading we just looked at in Zechariah. It's, it's a wonderful prophecy, isn't it? And it's speaking about um, a time to come. Zechariah 14, and we'll probably know, don't we, there's this emphasis as we go through about these words in that day. In that day, it says it over and over again. It says it doesn't in verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the mounts of olives. Verse 6, it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Verse 8, and it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem. And in these, these lovely words in verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. And so as we can look forward to these wonderful times, we ask the question for ourselves, where do we want to be in that day? Because we, we have a choice 
do we not? So we have some wonderful words, familiar words, don't we, in, in 2 Peter. Things that give us such a wonderful assurance. It says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. For unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And that word sure means stable or steadfast. And when we look at prophecy, which really is the unfolding of God's mind, isn't it? Of God's will and purpose. A wonderful thing that's been revealed unto us, that the will and the mind of God. And as we look in contrast to the world around us in its darkness and confusion and the instability and uncertainty, when we come to God's word, we have that stability, don't we? That concrete ground, that sure word of prophecy. Peter goes on to say, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation or, or our own application. Because the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by but holy men of God spake as they were moved or driven by the Holy Spirit. So these things are of God. They give us confidence. They are God's will, God's unfolding of his plan and purpose that we can look back in history and see and testify to and look forward with great hope to that day of promise, which he has promised for us. And isn't it wonderful that we have this, these lovely images and pictures described for us that give us such a, a focus. We know, don't we, uh, the words of, of the Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And we thank our Heavenly Father that we have a vision, especially in these desperately dark ages. We have a, a vision bright before us to help us, to encourage us, to carry on, to labour into that rest. Because God has indeed appointed a day, as we know, in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And sadly, sometimes we hear these words, don't we, that, well, the Jews have been back in the land and it's been over 70 years now and, and Christ still hasn't returned. And we have to be careful, don't we, because... It's, it's a rather insular way of thinking, is it? When we think of God's grand plan and, and what is man, what is our life? It is but a vapour that appeareth for a little while and is gone. So when we project out and look at God's master plan, we are but a dot in this time scale, and all things will happen according to his purpose and according to his will. And so we have these words so in Second Peter again to encourage us Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then he says, but beloved, that's us, isn't it? Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then we have the excitation, don't we? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? So as these things in the world that we see around us, that the world clings to, these things will be dissolved. They're passing away. And so the finger is, 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 is on us, his onus is on us, isn't it, to examine ourselves. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting until the day, till the coming of the day of God. And that word hasting means to await eagerly, to be eagerly anticipating that day. And that's what we should be doing. And hopefully tonight this will help us as we look forward um, to that great day of promise, not with trepidation, but eagerly anticipating the master's return. And, and prophecy is a, a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because we can look back in history and it helps us to understand where we are now in God's plan and purpose. We can look back and see um, the, the, the governments and the systems and the powers which have been put in place, 
We can see the apostate church and the warnings that gives for us. We can think of the faithful saints who led very different lives not that many years ago, who were troubled and tortured and, and chased and sadly killed for their belief. And that inspires us, doesn't it? It gives us confidence when we look at their faith and what they had to go through. And when we look at our lives, especially in, in this country, how easy we have it. And so the warning is for us in this affluent and apathetic age um, that we don't become spiritually dead. And we look to those examples of those that have gone before that gave all, didn't they? And it meant everything to them, the hope of the kingdom. And, and finally, before we start looking at these things, it's a wonderful privilege, isn't it, brothers and sisters, when we think about how God's word and his message has been revealed to us. When we look at the churches around us, they're in darkness, aren't they? Gross darkness. We, we thank God that he's revealed these things unto us. What a, a wonderful privilege that we can look forward and we know um, what is coming on this earth. We know that judgment is coming, righteous judgment from God. And we can see these things coming to pass and so these things can help us and can warn us and we can speak to our friends and our neighbors can't we because we know the things that are coming on the earth and we so we can reach out to them in love as we know that when the lord jesus for christ many will look to him as the antichrist to come up and fight against him and we know these things are coming so we can help one another and those around us and warn them of this impending judgment and those things which are coming on the earth. And so as we start to, to, to look at these things, as we look through, hopefully, in a sad way, really, we see graphically, don't we, the, all the ugliness of, of the flesh, all the deceit and the deception. We, we see the pride of life, don't we? We see um, men fighting for, for power trying to solve things themselves, leaving God out of the equation. And, and in itself, that can be quite excitational for us, that we stand away and apart from the things that we see in the world, that we have a better hope, a sure and certain foundation that we can follow. And we look forward in confidence to that great day of uh, God Almighty. Okay, so let's, um, let's have a, a little look through um, some of these things that we want to, to look at the scene. So we're going to look at some of the things happening in the nations surrounding Israel. Uh, we want to look at um, the, the spirit of the age in which we're, we're living in, the instability and the social aspect that we see. I um, also want to look at, just briefly, um, some of the global issues that we see around in the world today. And finally, we want to look at the excitation for ourselves and how all these things can help us on how we can help each other as we walk together um, to God's kingdom. So let's have a look at our first slide here. And so this is an incredible event, wasn't it, really, when we, we look at the Abraham Accords. It's been mentioned quite a few times before, but this idea of this peace, this first public normalization of relations between Arab uh, countries and Israel since the time of Egypt out of Egypt in 1979 and Jordan in 1994. Incredible, really, when we think about it. And a lot of this was headed, wasn't it, by, by President Trump, that one who was so pro-Israel. When we think of Ezekiel 38, when it speaks of that time of, of peace, of that, that northern invasion coming against Israel, to that land of unwalled villages and to those that dwell at rest, and that peace. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens and how these relationships develop, as, as many others have, have put forward to possibly join um, these peace agreements, Sudan and Morocco and, and Saudi Arabia. And as we think about these things, we see um, back in January this year how some of the things are beginning to develop, these relationships between Israel and the United uh, Arab Emirates, and we think of, of them and their struggles with food when we look at the, um, the UAE. And they depend 
on food being imported to them. And they've been speaking to Israel and these other countries to make these things more stable as they build up relations with them. And also to do with energy, the Israel's energy minister, it says, has been speaking with Gulf state counterparts, um, with uh, Morocco and Sudan and Bahrain. And so we see some of these ties and these relationships starting to form between Israel and some of these Arab countries. A few years ago, who would have thought that these, these things would happen? And we've, these things have developed further. It says Israel opens embassy in the UAE. And also the United Arab Emirates um, cabinet have approved an embassy in Tel Aviv as well. And so we see these relationships developing, developing. And we see the UAE and Bahrain, it calls for a joint stand with Israel in the approaching the US on this, on the Iranian threat. And when we think of, of Iran, as we'll look at in a moment, and um, their, their nuclear energy and the deal that they're trying to um, agree on at the moment, we see these countries in Israel trying to come together as one to deal with this threat. And only just recently, um, with Iran, we, we can see that this, this deal, potential deal, this nuclear deal, it is coming to fruition. If you think about the history of this, it was back in 2015, wasn't it, that Iran agreed a long-term deal on the nuclear program um, due to the, the rumours and the, the, the danger, wasn't it, of, the, of them developing these nuclear weapons. And inspectors were, were called in to monitor the situation. But then it was back in, in, in 2018 that Trump um, reinstated many sanctions, heavy sanctions on Iran which caused Iran to, to respond and to reject some of these sanctions. And so over these last couple of years, it's now come to um, a head and maybe over the next week or two, God willing, we'll see what will happen with this nuclear deal. But the, the point is really, when we look at the, the new president of the United States, when we look at President Biden, very different, isn't he, from um, President Trump and all that he stood for. And Biden is seen really in these negotiations as, as being quite weak and indecisive. It says Biden has a poor hand when it comes to nuclear talks with Iran. And, and as we'll see, Biden seeks, it would seem to, um, to reverse the effects and reverse some of these bans and agreements that Trump um, has put in place, says that doesn't it? when former US President Donald Trump scrapped the Iran nuclear deal and applied a maximum pressure campaign of sanctions, he was widely derided and criticized. But then goes on to say, instead, Tehran is now faced by a more dovish Biden who is following a similar tack to the Obama administration he was part of since 2009. In a region where traditional US allies have lost faith in American leadership, Biden is going to face an uphill struggle to get Iran um, to, to agree with these things. So we see with President Biden that they look at him as a, as a weak point in these things. And really he's going to have to, sit, to, to stick his neck out to, to see what he can do with, these, with this deal that is, is, coming, is coming to fruition. And so when we look at the Iranian um, leader, and we see President Biden is um, facing critics from his, his party, from the Republican critics, that he is starting to reverse some of these sanctions that uh, President uh, Trump um, initiated. So this can be bad news, couldn't it, for, for Israel? We know Iran and its threat to, to Israel. The consequences uh, a weak deal could have for Israel if some of these sanctions are lifted. And, and just moving on to um, President Biden, another good example of this, when we think about the, um, the, the gas pipeline, the Nord 2 gas pipeline, um, that is, is now 95% complete, that, that gas line from Russia under the Baltic Sea, which is going to Germany. And again, President Trump heavily um, put sanctions on these things. But we see now that Biden is, is under pressure and is starting to 
um, lift and waver some of these sanctions and, and, and troubled by his relationship with, with Germany, not wanting to upset his relationship with Germany. So we see um, this, this weakness, as it were, of Biden moving away um, very much so from the, the thinking of, of, of President Trump and his party as he looks to, to waver these sanctions of the Russian pipeline. And we'll look at this a little bit later on, some of the effects that this could have um, later on this year. When we look at what other people um, people think of, of Biden, um, especially in, in Europe, it says most Europeans rejoiced at Joe Biden's victory in, in the November US presidential election, but they do, do not look as Biden as a strong character, do they? They do not think he can help America make a comeback as the preeminent global leader. And so whereas maybe under, under Trump's regime, they were looking to him. Now they evaluate the EU and their own country's systems much more positively than that of the US. They are looking to, to Berlin rather than Washington as the most popular partner. And so we see this, this, this weakening of power, so it would appear, under the Biden regime. People losing trust and faith in him. But let's just have a quick look at this, this man, Biden. So he's only the, the second um, uh, Catholic uh, president of, uh, of America. But when we look at his objectives, they're very different to, to President Trump. Trump was very pro-Israel, wasn't he? This Israel first policy. You think of the things that he did. He moved the U.S. state embassy to Jerusalem. He stopped funding to Palestinians. He recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. But let's look at some of the objectives of Biden. They're very different. He's, he's plowing in nearly $2 trillion to the coronavirus relief package. He's very big on climate change. He's hoping to, by 2050, have a 100% clean economy. He's heavily investing into infrastructure, infrastructure and into immigration. And we think of, of President Trump. He was imposing these bans on, on immigration, especially from the, the Muslim countries. And, and now Biden is seeking to reverse those bans. He's also reversing bans on transgender Americans joining the military. And so he's got a radically diverse cabinet, very different to that of President Trump. And we see there, it talks of equity, inclusion, and unity. And so Biden seems very pro Europe. He's just announced a six trillion budget plan, infrastructure uh, plan, sorry, which is looking at infrastructure, education, and climate change. So these going forward are the things that he is focusing in on. And we see very little mention of Israel. It's as though he's walking away from Israel and leaving that power vacuum behind. So Biden often talks a, a good talk, and we know that there is this, um, this this conversation, this meeting between himself and President Putin coming up, and he, he talks a tough tone on Russia. He says here, doesn't see that. Um, I made it clear to President Putin, a matter very different from my predecessor, that the days of the US rolling over in the face of Russia's aggressive actions, interfering with our election, with cyber attacks, poisoning its citizens, are over, said Mr. Biden. And so the test will come in a few weeks, God willing, and we see if he will follow through, follow through on some of these, these forceful um, accusations. Well, America is in, in a weak state, not to be surprised with the, the, the current pandemic. It says there, doesn't it? The US federal debt to exceed the size of the economy, even before Biden's stimulus is approved. And so they, we see this, this, this weakening, this weak nation. And we see here, Biden, modest Middle East medicine. We see him here in this graphic, walking away, as it were, tiptoeing um, carefully away from the, the Middle East as he wants to address these things to do with China and climate change. So we see a, a complete reversal, really, from the, um, from the era of, of Trump. 
and and so it would seem that we have this 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 great weakness here from Biden compared to his his predecessor. And really, we see a good example of this maybe when we we think back and um, back to the nineties in our own country in the UK and those that were in power. We think of the the Tory um, leaders Thatcher and John Major, and at the time when um, we were looking for um, Britain leaving the EU, and then all of a sudden um, this Labour man comes in, Tony Blair, who's very pro-European, and we would think, wouldn't we, looking at him, well, how can this work out in God's plan that Britain is to leave Europe, looking at this very pro-European leader? It's a good example, isn't it, of, of how God works, at looking at the bigger picture and letting these things take place in God's timetable and not in ours. And really when we, we look at this um, from, from Biden, we see he's paving the way really for Russia to, to come down and to assimilate his power. And no doubt Russia and Putin is rubbing his hands together as he sees Biden coming away. Well, let's just move on and have a look at, um, at Israel. Obviously, well known in the, re in the news recently, this, this Palestinian and Israeli um, war, this 11 days of fighting with over 240 casualties, which has been major headline news, hasn't it? And it's interesting, as always, with Israel, too, to look at the reactions, the nations, and the sentiments of those around. And, and this, this all sparked off, didn't it, with the, the festivals of Ramadan and the threat of... of um, Israel evicting Palestinians from their neighbourhood in East Jerusalem. And let's just have a look at some of the um, reactions. And so we see that the UN inquiry into Israel calls for an unprecedented permanent probe critiquing Israel. And so there was a call for a permanent commission of inquiry to be set up to report on rights violation in Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. Opening the council session, UN Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet said she was concerned about the high level of casualties in Gaza and warned that Israeli strikes might constitute war crimes. And we see um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's um, reaction here, denouncing the UN Human Rights Council's shameful decision to establish a permanent commission of inquiry into alleged abuses in Israel and Palestinian um, areas. It goes on to say um, at the bottom there, this while depicting as the guilty party a democracy acting legitimately to protect its citizens from thousands of indiscriminate rocket attacks. This travesty makes a mockery of international law and encourages terrorists worldwide. And so we can see this, how this, this might develop under the um, human rights and how they might target um, Israel. Undoubtedly, oh, sorry, unsurprisingly, um, reactions from um, Palestinians about Israel committing state terrorism, war crimes in Gaza, and also from Iran, calls for international action on Israel. The, these inhumane acts, as they describe Israel, of of this reaction to this to this uh, Palestinian and Israeli. War. And if you look at the bottom there, it mentions, if you can see that, it talks about action on genocide lapse and racial cleansing being committed by Israel. And we see the strong sentiment and the hatred coming out from Iran and from Palestine and these other nations. So when we, we think about Israel, we know that they are, are God's people, don't we? We know that all that gets involved with Israel will be as a, a, a they are as a, a burdensome stone and will be cut in pieces. We see, as we often do, don't we, this continued anti Semitism against Israel, this growth of support um, against them. And as we see in, in Biden, as he starts to, to leave them, leave Israel alone and to, to go away and to walk out, as it were, um, it, we see this, this loss of ally in them. And we see Israel um, struggling and uh, uh, alone. Of course, we know, don't we, that there'll be no lasting peace until the Lord Jesus Christ's return. 
And so we indeed pray, don't we, for the peace of Jerusalem. We, we pray for that time when they, the Jews, instead of trusting in themselves, will look to their Lord and will mourn and will turn back to him and put their trust and confidence in him. Well, let's just move over to um, somebody else. Let's look at President Putin. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because unlike Biden, who's just come into power, this, um, this man's been in power for over 20 years. We know these few things about him, that he studied law at Leningrad State University. In 1975, he joined the KGB. In uh, 1996, moved to Moscow to work in the Kremlin. He was then appointed head of Russian Federal Security Service in 1998. And then in 1999, of the turn, he was named Prime Minister by Boris Yeltsin and acting president um, at the end of the year 1999 after Yeltsin resigned. But it's amazing, isn't it, for the time this man's been in power, how little we actually know about Putin. But when we, we look at Putin, we see, as it were, don't we, a, a, a sly fox, someone that's a, a political and a military tactician, someone that you're never quite sure what he's going to do next, or we're never really sh- sure what the truth is and what he's doing. And when we when we think of him, we know that he's just um, put through a government, hasn't he, this allowance now that he can actually um, run for presidency for two more times, which will, in theory allow him to stay in power until 2036, a massive length of time. We see see him, Putin, doing that. He wants to continue to grow Russia as as its sphere of influence continues to develop um, around the world. He's very much heading this to return to that that Soviet Union as it was and and those times of the, the SARS. But as we've mentioned, don't we, we see these these undermined things which continually crop up are associated with Putin. And the, these things about the US sanctions, US sanctions Russia over the solar winds um, hack. Uh, the Biden administration now on Thursday that will impose financial penalties on Russia and expelled several Russian diplomats from the US in response to the country's cyber hacking and its attempts to interfere in the 20. 20- 20 election and we see there the um it wasn't me sort of thing on the right there with with putin but all these things are always going on in the background there's no trust this was something which was was bigger than news fairly recently too wasn't it this this power struggle with navalny and this opposition man we know that the the undermined and unhanded things that it would appear putin has has tried to do to to silence this this man and he's now um, put this bill through to, to stop anyone running for office who is seen as an extremist, any one of Navalny's um, cohorts or friends that would run for presidency, that Putin is pulling the strings and, and stopping anyone else getting into power and, and stopping his, his plans. Well, when we think of um, Navalny, well, he's the... Um, the opposition party, isn't he? Russia of the future. And this all started really back in, in 2011 um, when he was um, accusing, wasn't he? He was exposing the, the corruption by the Russian officials. I'm not sure if you can see that's a little bit um, small, the, the, the time. Um, in 2017, Russia saw the largest anti government protests in years. And so Navalny is heading up these things. In 2013, Navalny unsuccessfully ran to become mayor of Moscow. And then in 2018, he began the leader of the opposition party, Russia of the future, but was barred from running for presidency because of his criminal record. And so we see Putin trying to, to silence this, this man and to stop any uprising against him and his reign of power. Also, when we, in recent events of the last few months, and we see these tensions, don't we, between the Ukraine and Russia, and Putin says Ukraine is becoming anti-Russian, Putin says, and we, we know um, that from these Russian, these Russian, um, the massing Russian troops on the Ukraine border. But basically, what is, what is happening here 
is that um, the president of the Ukraine uh, court place, Viktor Medvedchuk, a pro-Russian politician and personal friend of Putin under house arrest. And that's caused these reactions um, from Putin. And Putin sees this as a, a cleansing of, of the country's political space. And you see that, that Russia has been holding these black sea drills amid Ukraine tensions. And also it's interesting that Russian passports have been handed out um, to areas here in the Ukraine. And this was, of course, what happened before they annexed Crimea, these handing out of, of these passports. And so people look uh, with concern and worry as um, to, to see what will happen with the Ukraine and what uh, Russia will do. So we see that Russian troops are still on the Ukraine's border. Only 100,000 troops, it's thought, are to be on the, on the borders of the Ukraine. And Putin says here, Ukraine is becoming an anti-Russia and pledges response. And, and for all the things that Putin says, we can certainly agree that when he says something like that, that he will pledge a response and a response um, will come. Also, when we think about how Putin is expanding his power, this, this new base in, in Truffield, in, in the Arctic, that, that Russia is trying to stake a claim to, uh, and many others are trying to stake a claim. And, and if you if you look online and see some of these videos, you can see this this massive base and this weaponry which he is amassing in this region. So Russia are, are are staking a claim to it, this area where there is believed to be much oil and gas reserves in, in the Arctic. Also, recently we, we see this. Um, the, the Russian World War II victory parade, the show of, of Russian mighty strength and power. And it's incredible, isn't it? When we think not that many years um, ago, how debased and, and how weakened and disgraced Russia was. And yet, um, 20, 30 years later, we see the, the complete opposite, a complete reversal in so many ways. This, this mighty Northern Confederacy, this mighty Northern power, which is slowly and surely amassing um, its power and putting its influence throughout the, the world. We see this, don't we? We mentioned this earlier, um, the Nord 2 um, pipeline, possibly finished this year, it's believed 95% finished. And we see again Biden to looking to waiver these sanctions as it's to be finished. And we might think, well, what are the implications of this? Well, there are many reasons really to oppose um, to oppose this. It's obviously going to bypass the existing line that runs through the, the Ukraine at the moment. It's going to go straight to Germany and have a, a, a great influence there. We see Russia coming into the heart of, of Europe. It will obviously add additional leverage, wouldn't it, to, to Russia, who would be in control of, of how much gas flows through this pipeline and, and its ability to turn it on and to turn it off. And also, um, we see that with this, this sphere of influence as Russia bypasses the Ukraine. And in doing so, Russia will no longer have to pay them billions of dollars of transit fees. And so we can see how this can, can weaken the Ukraine whom it, it would appear is seeking to, to take over. Another underhanded thing you may or may not have seen it says here, Putin's shadow warriors stake claim to Syria's oil. And so we have this almost underground network it's described as a shadowy Russian mercenary group known as Wagner, which has played a pivotal role in Moscow's destabilizing activities around the world. And these deals are, are presumably being struck up um, uh, around the world. And it says there, doesn't it? The deal comes as Moscow seeks to entrench its strategic foothold in Syria and by extension, further expand its reach into the Mediterranean. So we can see um, the, the fingers of Putin, all these pies he's got his fingers in, haven't they? The, these um, areas of influence and power he's constantly um, doing and striking different deals. Very difficult to, to keep up with, and, and that's just the sort of person that he seems to be a, a tremendously excellent tactician as he's growing his sphere of influence. And we see, as it were, this cloud this storm growing in 
the north. And so we see here um, US, Russian. Excuse me, that minute, sorry, I can't see the. Uh, US Russian standoff to take center stage as Biden and Putin agree meeting. And this is the meeting we were mentioning earlier that's to happen in the next few weeks, um, God willing. And this is some of the, the sentiments that have come from Biden. The US president has called Mr. Putin a killer and relations are so low with the allegations of hacking and election interference. So we see a, a cold response. Um, it would be good to, wouldn't it, to be a fly on the wall in this meeting. It says in response, Russia recalled its ambassador to the US for the first time in more than 20 years. We see this, this cold relation, which is to be expected, isn't it? That this power of the North and Biden, that from the Confederacy in the South. And so to, to summarize this, this section, we see Russia, don't we, continuing to amass weaponry and power and influence and yet nobody really knows who with his next move nothing is is quite as it seems uh, and so we know don't we from ezekiel 38 that this this power is going to come down into the land of israel and at that time no one is going to be able to withstand his power and his force the speed of which he comes down that great company as it's described that will come like a storm to cover the land, and that will look to take a spoil from Israel. But we know and can be comforted, don't we, from the word of God, that these things are coming and that God will intervene and the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints to put down this Russian power. And, and the aim and the conclusion of all these things is that God's name will be magnified among the nations, not Putin's, but God's name will be magnified and exalted in the sight of all these nations. And it's a, a wonderful prospect for that time to come. And that pride and the power of man will be abased and put down. Well, let's quickly move on to have a quick look at, um, at the UK. Incredible times, really, aren't they? I mean, this has been, we might say, dragging on for a long time. But eventually, 31st of December 2020, UK left the EU single market. And, and when we think of God's sure word of prophecy, isn't it wonderful when you can think about um, brethren have lived in the past. We think of John Thomas, 1850, over 150 years ago. And these men were convinced, these, these brothers, weren't they? Britain cannot be included among them, making reference to the toes of the image. And Graham Pearce in his Milestones of the Kingdom, 1981, though we don't know how it will happen, Britain will separate, Britain will separate from Europe. Paul Billington, Gardens of Israel and Arabia, 1990, says Britain's eventual exit from Europe is a certainty. And it's incredible, isn't it? <clears throat> it's incredible when we, when we look at these Things We know that Britain won't be a part of that European system that will give their power to the beast for that one hour, but will be separate from it as part of the confederacy of the king of, of, of the south. And this, these amazing statements give us great confidence, conviction, don't they, that, that God's word can give us that, that focus and that direction, that confidence that the things is written will come to pass. And obviously that wasn't a smooth transition, was it? When we, we think of those things um, after they left, we, we get these um, issues, don't we? No hard border, and the problems that came up in Ireland and also the problems with COVID-19 of the friction between distributing the, um, the vaccines and where they would go uh, in relation to the EU. Well, let's just pause for a moment and, and, and switch to... Uh, another tack. Let's think of this social unrest that we see and, and largely been um, exacerbated by COVID-19. So we see this here. Um, it says the Great Reset. And we have here um, Cloud, sorry, uh, Klaus um, Schwab, a German economist and the founder of the World Economic Forum. And he was saying basically there's no getting back to normal after COVID-19. 
And this great reset really is to do with dealing with the, the income and the wealth and the inequality which has been highlighted by COVID-19. And there's been a, a Davos manifesto of 2020 which is calling for a better and more inclusive kind of capitalism to bridge the inequality. And it says that on the screen, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world. So what are these things all about? Well, we suggest that these things go far beyond just the economic um, agenda. They talk really of a great resetting of, of social and economic priorities. They talk about um, climate change, peace and justice, quality education and gender equality. And so these things go far beyond just the economy. It's a great reset of, of all things. And unsurprisingly, there we see who's there with them included is the, the Pope, who's going to head, head up that, that moral side of all things. And so there are 27 core members described as the guardians with the Pope, who is heading the moral side. Such a powerful influence of these, um, of these people, these heads of business leaders with, with trillions of, of dollars between them. And they're looking to the Pope for this moral side of things. And we, we know from the, from the Pope, don't we, the, this, this false doctrine, it says, doesn't it, in Revelation 18, verse 16, describes this, this apostate system, that great city which is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And so we see this, the, the, the Pope and this system, how he gets involved, as they always have done over the years, in, in politics uh, and is heading up these things here but we know as we read on in revelation 18 for it says for in one hour so great riches is come to naught we know that these things will not stand and these things will be will be taken away from them and so when we think of this 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 system let's have a little look here at, at, at some of the things it says of this uh, inclusive capitalism it says at the bottom there, this council will follow the warning from Pope Francis to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor and answer society's demands for a more equitable and sustainable model of growth. No, of course, all these plans will be futile as they will not stand because they do not involve almighty God or his son. And yet, brothers and sisters, we know um, indeed that there is a great reset coming, not organized by man, but organized by almighty God, a great resetting when the kingdoms of this earth will be the kingdoms of our Lord, when he will judge in righteousness and in peace. It says in Isaiah 11 verse 4, that he will judge with righteousness, shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. So as we look at these things, we have to ask ourselves the question, at, at that time, which side do we want to be on? Which side do we want to be a part of? Okay, so as we're starting to, to bring our thoughts to a close, when we think of, of COVID-19, it says here, if history is a predictor, unrest may re-emerge as the pandemic eases. And we see some of these issues, this social unrest, that is growing and almost power to the people as the, these things go on. Let's look at a good example um, of this, a, a well-known group which is growing more and more. We, we see this last year really has been a, a year of protests, of, of activist groups, of power and influence of people and of uh, the, the power of social media. And when we look at this uh, group here, Black Lives Matter, as so many of these things, they're not as they would seem. Such an emotive subject, isn't it? Black Lives Matter, that, that people can join and, and harness and, and join and grow up to. But we know when we look into the details of these things that they go far beyond what they project to say. We know um, that, that, that this group, that two of their leaders are Marxists, that um, they are looking to change, not uh, just Black Lives Matter, but their, their practice and their, their underlying motives and agenda 
look to change society and the structure of society, and they embrace um, these immoral practices which are abhorrent to the ways of God. And we see there last year uh, for, uh, 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 a slide from the one of the BM leaders. It says, if change doesn't happen, then we will burn down this system. And we also see how Black Lives Matter have this thing with um, supporting Hamas and terrorism. So things are never quite as they seem. And this is incredible. It says here, from Ferguson to Palestine, as Black Lives Matter seek to change the US debate on the Middle East, how they are supporting the Palestinian cause and using this Black Lives Matter as an umbrella for all these different agendas of theirs. It says on the right there, don't we, Palestinian lives matter. And it says at the bottom of that slide there, in Congress, a lawmaker who cut her teeth as Black Lives Matter organizer and who has compared her clashes with police to those faced by Palestinians. So two very different situations, but we see how this, the, these things can grow and be used um, in, in many different ways to support their agenda. And we see also this pressure is coming through to, to President Biden. Biden's staff has urged President to hold Israel accountable and protect Palestinian lives. It says, meanwhile, a new generation of Americans, including Jewish Americans, have grown up with a heightened consciousness of social justice movements. Sanders and others have compared the Palestinian struggle to Black Lives Matter and want to apply domestic principles to foreign policy. And we see this, can't we? These, these domestic things, they're now seeking to use the same things for, for their foreign policy and putting great pressure on the governments and presidents to um, uh, manipulate them for their own end. And so it's tremendously frightening stuff. So let's quickly move on. You see here the storming of the Capitol in January 6, 2021. Again, the power of social media during the elections. But let's move on to this, um, the spirit of the age in which we live. And when we think about the, 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 the free and clean spirit of these frogs coming out of the mouth of the beast and of the dragon. And we think of this idea of post-truth, this ideology that, that's around today. It's incredible, isn't it? So they're relating to or donating circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Where there is no truth, where truth is relative, and the opinions and the feelings and the emotions and the thoughts of people seem to count more than absolute facts. And that is a frightening thing to think of in the society in which we live in um, today. We see don't we, that without truth, without foundations, people are so easily swayed by their emotion. And it's no different, is it, when we think back to the Lord Jesus and the time um, when he, before he died and Pilate, how easily the people were swayed, not by, by truth, but by emotions and the leaders before them. Truth isn't truth. This was uh, amazing, wasn't it, when we think of, of, of this man, Rudy, who joined Trump's personal legal team back in 2018 and was responding to allegations of the 2016 US election and, and to fake news. And it was comical to watch as a, a news reporter uh, was speaking to him about this, and, and he was saying, truth isn't truth. And the, the news uh, broadcaster was laughing, and it's just ridiculous, isn't it? What, what is truth? How can truth not be true? How people can argue these things is incredible. But really, when we think about it, this is the wisdom, isn't it, of this world? Uh, and it's the warning for us not to get involved with man's philosophies, with man's ideologies, these so-called clever people, because their teachings and practices are, 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 are ludicrous, aren't they? We need to, to, to think about ourselves, don't we? Our families, our ecclesias, the ecclesias, and how we need to stay separate from these things, that we don't allow this thinking and these thoughts into our hearts, into our lives, and let them affect um, God's truth. 
and this is another incredible one, isn't it? This 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 freedom of speech, this so-called freedom of speech. This pastor that stood up uh, and spoke um, God's truth from Genesis, and who has been accused of making, uh, who was arrested and accused of making allegedly homophobic comments for speaking the truth. Let's let's quickly move on. So we have this, we know we've all heard of national security and your cyber security, but this seems, this phrase here, epistemic security is to do with knowledge, being able to prove what is right and what is wrong. It's trying to support our, our information systems to make sure that they're robust. And basically saying there's a great threat these days to this, uh, such things such as, as fake news and, and four main things which are contributing to this problem are, are these. Talks of the internet here, attention scarcity. The, the internet has made massive quantities of information available to us. But it's difficult, it says, to sift through those things which are true and those things which are not. And, and with this, this abundance of information and the limitations on attention creates a fierce attention economy in which governments, journalists, interest groups and others must compete. And goes on to say, unfortunately, some of the most effective attention-grabbing strategies appeal to people's emotions and existing beliefs, and these sources are otherwise ambivalent about the truth. Second point here are filter bubbles and bounded rationality. It says, when facing information overload, people naturally prefer to pay more attention to like-minded individuals in their own communities over unfamiliar outsiders. Using social media platforms, it's easier than ever to form and join communities unified by shared beliefs and values. And another couple here, it talks about adversaries and blunderers. It says actors who intentionally manipulate information to maliciously mislead or deceive information recipients in order to lead them to false beliefs are called adversaries. And it goes on to say adversaries mount adversarial attacks to incite people to action based on misleading or false information. And then lastly, this idea of erosion of, of tricks, how, how modern technology can, can turn something minor into something major uh, and circulate it that way, and how this can affect and influence us. So let's quickly look at this, this last stage. We've just thought about these things we see, don't we, really, in the world in which we live, how unstable our society is, how people's opinions and emotions are heightened and how easily they are swayed, how truth has been disregarded, this um, disinformation, not knowing what is true, what is not, from things that we read, and how popular opinion and, and, and emotions often override the things which are true. And when we think of the, the spirit of those unclean frogs which go out to deceive the nations, we see them in these examples before us. We see this utter confusion. And we wonder, don't we, if the Lord remains away, what the next generation growing up will be like as the truth has been gradually lost. In Psalm 85, verse 11, it's a wonderful hope that we look forward to where it says, truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven and we look to that kingdom age when there'll be truth all around us springing out of the earth as it describes so our time is gone so let's just quickly bring our thoughts to a close these last few things we're going to look i won't say long at all the global risks report um un unsurprising infectious diseases at the top there but also livelihood crisis extreme weather events we look at climate change cyber security which is seems on the up all the time but also there when we look further down unsurprisingly youth disillusionment and that's no surprise is it any, is it any wonder in the world in which we're growing up in now and these young ones are growing up in with all these confusing things no wonder there is this disillusionment for the young a sad sad time so quickly, COVID expected to cost Britain 372 billion, says National Audit Office. And really the monetary side is only half, half the story, isn't it? All these other things that we've looked at briefly, these implications that, that, that come out of this other 
um, than, than, than monetary things, this instability of social order. The International Monetary Fund estimates the global COVID cost at 28 trillion in lost output, an uh, uh, inconceivable amount of, of money. When we think of, of, of these cyber threats, these, it says that the average ransomware costs have more than doubled in 2021 as they are on the rise. And a good example of this here, um, we see, don't we, with Colonial Pipeline and how people hacked in and they, they paid out in the 4.4 million to a gang of hackers who broke into their computer systems. And these things are becoming more and more common, aren't they? And they have a knock-on effect in the costings and trust and so on. So really, looking at global issues, we know the world has no answer to these things, the things of, of climate change and, and all these things. There is no solution. They, they are insoluble, aren't they? And we look to that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to set the world to right. And, and, and left to himself, man would destroy this planet. So let's just bring our thoughts to a close and with the, the excitation for ourselves, brothers and sisters. When we look at these things, they can be quite depressing, can't they, when we look at the state of the world. But as we said before, these things are not depressing for us, are they? Because we don't live in the world. We have this wonderful vision of the, of the glorious kingdom to come. And this was the message from Haggai, wasn't it? When we think back to Haggai, it says this. He was rebuking them, wasn't he? Because the house of God laid waste. And he says to them, Haggai 1 verse 4, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? And so they were busy amassing their own riches, weren't they? And the house of God laid waste. And so we have to be careful, though, in the, in the affluent and the apathetic age in which we live, that we don't get caught up the things of this life, the things of this world, but that indeed we consider our ways. And we've had much opportunity over the past years. The world has been slowed down to think about these things. And so we need to think about God's spiritual house and how we are reacting. And, and the challenge is for us there, isn't it? What do we want most? What's our primary desire? And it's wonderful, isn't it, brothers and sisters and people, as we come to this week ahead, this, this great time where we can come away from the world to focus on the things of the truth that can help us and rejuvenate us, our faith. And when we can think about the nearness of the Lord's return, we indeed can examine ourselves and consider our ways. And so this idea of desire says here that the sweet psalmist says, doesn't he, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? It says, doesn't it, he that have clean hands and a pure heart, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So we have a choice to make, don't we? Where do we want to be? Do we want to be with the Lord in that day? Or do we want to be left behind with this evil world and so brethren sisters in conclusion now is is not the time is it to to rest to put our confidence in the riches of our of, of our own riches the world is indeed passing away with all the affections and the lusts thereof that great reset is coming isn't it not the reset that the world speaks of but the reset of the lord god sending his son establishing his wonderful kingdom so it's time to Invest our time in ourselves, in our families, in our ecclesias to keep ourselves separate, to keep ourselves focused on that wonderful hope that waits each and every one of us. Be that our, our desires are heightened, our visions are sharpened, and our resolve is strengthened. May our lamps be trimmed and burning brightly, ready to meet the bridegroom as we, as we lift up our heads, for our Redeemer surely cometh says, doesn't it, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Even so come, Lord Jesus.